In my years of teaching guitar, I've noticed certain similarities in what stops intermediate guitar players from advancing to the next level. This is actually good news, let me tell you why. It's because of this common thread that binds these particular roadblocks that make it easier to find a solution that'll work for pretty much any intermediate guitarist that's dealing with this issue. So I've compiled a list of the roadblocks that prevent most intermediate guitar players from advancing to the next level. And I'm gonna provide you the solutions to each of those roadblocks. And hey, be sure to stick around to the end of the lesson because I've got a free gift for you and your guitar that you're gonna love. Let's talk about the first thing that prevents intermediate guitar players from progressing, and that's not knowing the names of the notes on the fretboard. Now maybe you know a handful of notes on the fretboard like, you know, this is G, this is A, this is E, right? The keys of the people. <laughs> but uh, if I were to pick a random note on the fretboard and have you tell me the note name, and you'll have to really think about it, or you just blank, you know, that's a problem. It's important foundational knowledge to know the names of the notes on your fretboard. So I'm gonna teach you exactly how to figure those out in the easiest way possible, okay? So starting with the open low E string, right? We're gonna take the open string and the first fret and third fret, and we're gonna figure those notes out. So that's E, F, and G. Just memorize that, E, F, G, E, F, G, E, F, G, E, F, G. Memorize that, right? Next, we're gonna move up here to the fifth fret, and we're gonna play the fifth fret, seventh fret, and eighth fret with our first, third finger, and fourth fingers. We're gonna play these notes. And these are A, B, C. So just remember that, A, B, C. A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. That's those notes, A, B, C. And then, if we move up two frets here to the 10th fret, that is D. Okay, so that's gonna be our starting little framework here. So we have E, F, G, A, B, C, D, okay? Now we're gonna fill in the blanks, right? Cause we have some frets in between. And of course, I'm sure you know, in music, there are sharps and flats. So if we were to go through the musical alphabet, which is, which is uh, comprised of 12 notes, and as far as the actual lettering, it's A to G and it just repeats. So there's no H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P when it comes with notes, just A to G and that's it. So we're starting with E cause it happens to be the lowest note that we're working with here on the low E string. That's an E note. So what comes after E in the alphabet? F, so we have E, F. And then of course we know G. But we have this note in between. So this note right here would be an F sharp or a G flat. All right, so we have E, F, F sharp, G. Now, the way I like to orient it, you know, and, and the way I see it done the most commonly, uh, because this note, which is F sharp, is also G flat. So how do you know which one to call it? I'd say it just depends on the context of where you're moving in pitch. If you're moving up in pitch, which is what is sharpening, right? Then you would just call this F sharp. If you're moving down in pitch, which is flattening, right? You would call this G flat. So it all comes down to the direction you're going to. But regardless of whether you call it F sharp or G flat, you'd be correct. So we have F, or sorry, E, F, F sharp, G. And then remember we have this note here. We didn't cover this. We went straight to A. But if we're going from G up one fret, that would be our G sharp, or A flat, because you know this is A, right? Remember A, A, sorry, A, B, C, remember that? A, B, C, so we have from G to G sharp to A, or A flat, right? G sharp, A flat, same note. Then we have A, right, A, B, C. Now we're in this position that we already memorized. We have A, and then next would be A sharp, or B flat, All right? So A, A sharp, B, C, and then we have D here, but there is a fret in between. So this right here, C, moving up one, would be C sharp or D flat. And then moving up from D, one more note, we have D sharp. And then on the 12th fret, that's E. So we've gone up one octave from a low E to a high E. So we've covered all 12 notes in the musical alphabet just on that string, uh, starting on E, right? E, F, F sharp, G. G sharp, A, A sharp, B. C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E. And if we were to descend, move it down, we'd be going E, E flat, D, uh, D flat, C, B, B flat, A, A flat, G, G flat, F, E. Okay, so just, you know, keep that in mind. When you're, when you're calling it sharp, it's from the context of moving up in pitch. When you're calling it flat, it's the context of moving down in pitch. But that's all 12 notes, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So that's all 12 notes in music covered on just the low E string. Now we could take that a step further and then start on the A string as well. We're not gonna do every single string. We only really need these two strings here, low E and A. So if we're gonna start with A, 
we were gonna go in this order. So we have open, second fret, third fret. And that's gonna be A, B, C, same as this. So we have A, B, C, and then we're gonna start this pattern again. A D, E, F. So fifth fret, seventh fret, eighth fret, D, E, F. And then we have right here, we have G on the 10th fret, okay? So doing that same process where we're gonna include the sharps and flats and stuff, starting with A, which is the first letter in the musical alphabet, so it's a little bit easier on the A string. We have A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp. And then A, if you wanna count the, the octave, right? And then moving down, let's move, let's move down from A. A, A flat, right, G, G flat, F, E, E flat, D, D flat, C, B, B flat, A. So just remember, we're moving in the order of the alphabet. So I'm throwing a lot of like letters at you, but it's really just in order. We went in order starting from E, the low E, right, including all the sharps and flats. And then we did that again, but starting from A, and did went through you know all 12 notes in the in the musical alphabet so the reason why both of those strings are important is because now that we have memorized those or once we do memorize those what we can do next to find the rest of the strings is use what's called the octave trick right so for example let's say you want to play me an f sharp and it's on the a string right that happens to be right here which is the ninth fret of the a string all right here's f right remember d e f f, f sharp now, if we wanted to find its octave, its upper octave, what we, need, what we need to do, and you can find this automatically just by following this little shape, we're gonna be taking our this other finger here, right? This third finger, we're gonna be going down two strings and over two frets from the original note, right? So down two strings, over two frets, leads us right here, which is the 11th fret of the G string, and that, my friend, is an F sharp. So we found now an F sharp on the 11th fret of the G string. Now, if we wanted to go a bit further and find an, the upper octave of that note, another F sharp, but even higher, when we're starting on the G string, the octave shape is a little different. We're still going down two strings, but we're going over in three frets. That's just the way the strings are oriented based on um, uh, concert, tune, concert pitch, right? So uh, the way we tune the guitar. So if we go three frets over, two strings down, that's the 14th fret of the high E string. That's another F sharp. So we have F sharp, F sharp, F sharp. So using that octave trick, we can now find that note. But let's say if we were to start with a note, let's say on the B string, and then work our way backwards. So if we were to just pick a random note here, sixth fret, right, of the B string. Now let's work our way down. So we wanna use the octave trick to work our way down because we don't know off the top what note this is because we've only memorized the notes on the low E and the A strings. So we would go down three frets and up two strings, right? So start with the original note, and then down three frets, right? one, two, three, up two strings. And there we have found uh, that note on the D string. Now, we haven't learned the notes on the D string, so we gotta go even further. We're gonna have to go an octave lower than that. So we would do this. We would go down two frets and up two strings, and that would lead us right here. First fret of the low E string. Now what note is that? Remember this is uh, E. So that makes this F, which would make this F, right? And also this one, that middle octave one we found along the way. So you see, see what I'm doing here? And this is actually a great exercise is to, once you memorize the low E and the A notes, then just pick a random note on either the high E string, B string, G string, whatever it is, any of the other strings, and then figure out what that note is using the octave trick. Now, the last thing I wanna say about this to keep in mind is if you are trying to find an upper octave from a note starting on the D string or the G string, right? You're going to want to use the three frets over, right, and two strings down, as opposed to two, right? So if it's, if let's say I'm trying to find this note right here, right, this starting on the D string, uh, the way that the guitar is tuned, if I'm gonna find its octave, I'm gonna have to go over three frets instead of two. Cause check this out, if I went over two and down two strings, ooh, that's not the note. There's the note. You hear that uniformity, right? And the frequencies there. As opposed to, where it sounds dissonant, right? There we go, that's the octave. Same note. So what note is this? Well, 
we started on the D string and we found it on the B string, we still don't know what it is. Let's go an octave lower. Now, since we're here starting on the D string going down, we can go two frets over instead of three. So we're going two frets down and then up two strings. That is B flat, right? Or A sharp, right? Because remember, A is right here, B is right here. It's right in between. So we now found a B flat slash A sharp, right? Just by using that, just reverse engineering it using the octave trick. The next thing that prevents intermediate guitar players from progressing is not taking control over their vibrato. This is a big one, it's super important. Usually when I see intermediate guitar players, they have decent enough chops, maybe they can wail on the minor pentatonic scale, but once they move to vibrato, it's just bad in comparison. Because like it or not, a surefire way to gauge a guitar player's worth is in how well they vibrato. They can shred up the fretboard, but if they vibrato and it's just not up to par, that kind of collapses the whole thing. And it's not just my opinion. You ask any self-respecting guitar player, especially if they're professional, if they've been in the industry a long time, vibrato is key. It's very important to have good vibrato. So, if you're able to play a cool pentatonic lick, like, but then when you go to vibrato, it's just this nervous, you know, kind of manic energy, th that doesn't tell me that there's any control there. So you gotta take control. If you just have one speed of your vibrato, and it's just go, you know, which doesn't necessarily take you anywhere reliable, then it's just gonna, it's just not gonna sound good, you know? So uh, what we gotta do to take control, okay, first of all, uh, I'll usually see either the really incredibly nervous manic fast vibrato or the type where it's like classical vibrato, but it's just done just way too quickly. Like that. You're putting way too much uh, <laughs> effort into like just not something that'll pay off very well for you because you barely hear the pitch oscillating when you do that. Now classical vibrato is a thing and it's great, but it only really works when it's done slowly. You can kind of hear the pitch just sort of washing in and out. But if you're going like this, it's just like, it gets all squiggly and weird, you know? Uh, so let's talk about how to control your vibrato. So the first thing that you should do Okay, and this is gonna sound silly, but, but bear with me here, is when you go to vibrato and you're doing that really fast manic thing, pretend like you're going into super slow motion, okay, while you're vibratoing. And then just slowly start to slow down your vibrato. It's gonna force you to take control of it. You gotta make sure that your vibrato is still even, right? The pitch is still oscillating evenly. So if, you, if you're automatic, if your start is this, then pretend like you're going into slow motion, so you'll do this. And really exaggerate it, you know, because you're, you're trying to force yourself to do something you haven't done before. So when you really exaggerate that slow motion, right, the slower you go, the more control you're gonna automatically take over it. So go as slow as possible until you just run out of sustain. Notice how if I want to keep those oscillations nice and even, I really got to think about what I'm doing. I have to sort of uh, be mindful of what my hand's doing on the fretboard. So this is why it's important, right? It's like subconsciously we're taking control because we can't really do the manic thing if we're going in slow motion. So you got to just do that, just to force yourself to play it at a different speed. Because ultimately you want to have at least control over three speeds, fast, medium, and slow, right? Now with fast, obviously you gotta have control over that. So using the manic approach is, is unreliable and it won't always get you the same results. So start slow and you'll learn how to do it slow by doing that slow motion practice, right? Or like thinking about like how an opera singer vibrato is that really wide, slow vibrato. Start there, you know, get comfortable with that and then start to increase speed a little bit. Medium vibrato is probably where you're gonna spend most of your time, right? So between slow and medium, I find myself using slow and medium the most, but you know, fast vibrato is also like, it has its place, especially if you fade into it, like Foxy Lady or something. It's cool, it's, and it works, you know? Uh, but you gotta be able to have control over at least those three speeds. Then over time, work your way into getting into the in-between spaces of in-between fast and medium or medium and slow, right? 
just being, being able to have control means that you can flow through that entire spectrum just fine because you have that control with your hands. So if you're vibratoing, if you're practicing this exercise going into slow motion, I, I want you to use all of your fingers because you're gonna use all your fingers to vibrato at some point, right? So if we're just doing, let's say, you know, like I've been doing here, fifth fret of the G string, starting with your first finger, your vibrato can be this kind of radial where it's making like a little crescent moon sort of shape. It's not like it's going directly up and down. It's this kind of radial motion. Right, and then we start moving on to other fingers. It's still kind of radial with uh, the second finger, right? Third finger tends to want to kind of bounce more up and down like Clapton style vibrato, you know? And then with the pinky, which deserves some action, right? So you can practice all three speeds with each finger, you know? So start if you start with the first finger, going into slow motion, right? And then doing the same thing with your second finger. You know, then... Same deal. It's just like a way to just take control and like find equilibrium as you slowly slow down. So that's the, that's a very, very effective exercise to gain control of your vibrato. And when you practice that daily, you're going to automatically have more of a nuanced approach to how you vibrato. And it's not going to be this kind of like manic Hail Mary kind of thing. Hey, real quick, if you're getting some value out of this lesson, be sure to hit that like button and consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. It helps us out a lot, but also lets us know that you enjoy these lessons and you want us to keep bringing you more. All right, back to the lesson. The next thing that prevents intermediate guitar players from progressing to the next level is not focusing on dynamics in their playing. A lot of times, guitar players will just have one dynamic where they're either playing as hard as they can or they're playing really soft and they just don't seem to get out of either one. And the way to approach that is through your picking hand. Your picking hand has a lot more control over not just dynamics, but even volume and how you're playing. So check this out. If I'm just doing a simple little pentatonic hotbox thing here, like just within those four notes, right? If I were to, you know, let's say go full bore and play as loud as possible. You know, just really like, really digging into the strings and doing that. That's great. But if that's all I do when I'm playing, you know, sometimes it's not gonna call for that. Sometimes, like especially if the band's breaking down a little bit or if I'm playing through a particularly soft or, or, or smoother style, you know, musical style of backing track or something, right? I want to match the vibe, right? Match the intensity. And that all comes from the picking hand. So if I wanted to do the same thing, I would just want to pick softer, but not, and, and, and listen, listen to the difference because I'm not changing anything as far as what, you know, guitar I'm using, where my volume's at, what pedal I'm using, none of that's gonna change. All that's gonna change is the intensity of my attack and the dynamics there. So I can go from playing nice and loud to like this. So see how it just, the moods just change and also the tone changes, right? I have like more volume, even a little bit more gain, a little more sustain when I pick hard and when I pick soft, it's warmer, there's a little less top in, it's rounder, it's a little sweeter, you know, compared to, you know, so whenever you're playing, if you're taking a solo, like a good exercise is uh, just like do, let's say, uh, one measure playing intensely and then one measure playing soft. Just alternate back and forth. And, and it becomes kind of a cool call and response thing. So you can actually do like, like kind of duel with yourself with this kind of call and response dynamics. So if you're gonna start with a lick like and then your follow up lick is and then your follow up lick after that. You know, then after that it adds a whole new dimension to what you're playing and you can play simple licks. It doesn't have to be anything complicated, right? Or flashy. It can be super, super simple. Just within that little pentatonic neighborhood I was just showing you. 
and all it was changing was my pick attack, and you could hear the dynamics quite clearly. The next thing that prevents guitar players from advancing to the next level is not being able to smoothly pivot between chords. Now what do I mean by that? So when you're changing chords, a lot of times what I'm noticing with intermediate guitar players is let's say they're trying to move from something simple, let's say like an open C chord, right, to a D chord. I'll notice this, they'll play the C chord, and then when they gotta move to the D chord, they'll just detach their fingers, and then just find them, and then just kind of paratroop their fingers down to the new shape, right? Now, that is fine, even if you're fast at it, that's fine, but it's not ideal, and here's why. Because you have to think about the space in between chords when you're playing them. If you find that there's dead space, even for a split second, like you can't just sustain the notes as long as possible, and still be able to like, you know, transition into the next chord. Like if it's like this, right? Unless it's intended to have that little rest in between, you know, it just doesn't flow. Especially if you have to like, take your fingers off, recalibrate them to find the next chord, and then do that. Because once you break your fingers off of the fretboard, you kind of have to restart, right? And where you position them. So here's my recommendation. Whenever you're moving between chords, Find the similarities between where your fingers, uh, like where your fingers end up basically between the chords. So for example, if we're going from C to D, okay, you shouldn't have to move too much, right? You can actually just really smoothly do that, this motion here. It doesn't require a lot of movement. Even if you did it one finger at a time, you know, over time you want to be able to just shift the whole shape. But if you're doing this, you know, I'm exaggerating a bit, but you can see how that would just cause some problems because that time where you're not, your fingers aren't even on the fretboard, there shouldn't be any noise, right? Because then it would just sound like that. So you want to find similarities or at least like where, where they kind of, uh, uh, where they are uh, in proximity with each other. So for example, from C to D, the first thing that I would want to do is take my second finger and then bring it down here and then this finger right here will come up next, and then it'll kind of fall into place like that. What that's actually doing is just allowing me to smoothly transition between the chords with little to no dead space in between. And that's actually an example of two chords that don't have too many similarities, where it's not like one finger is doing the same thing for both chords. For example, if we're playing a G chord to a D chord, check this out. This finger right here, my third finger, stays put the whole time. It doesn't move. It's like I just glued that finger to the fretboard, right? So when I start with that G chord, and then I want to move to the D chord, I'm not doing this, right? I'm seeing the similarities. Like this finger can stay put, I don't even have to do anything to it. And then these two fingers will just kind of jump in after I've removed my pinky, and then nice even flow between the chords, you know? And if I were to, let's say, move from D back to C, let's say, right? A similarity right here is actually the orientation of these two fingers, because check this out. I can move these two up here, and boom, I've gotten to the top part of the C chord, and then I just follow suit with my first finger, and there you go, I'm in there. Moving on to the next thing that prevents intermediate guitar players from making progress, is thinking that in order to play more music, you just have to learn more scales. Now scales are great tools and they're essential and you're gonna use them, that's just kinda how it works. But learning scales by themselves doesn't really do anything for you musically. Being able to learn and play a scale is really just reciting musical information, but it's not really creating music. I can go up and down a scale, that doesn't, that's not gonna make you feel anything, I don't think, right? That's not really where the creative process in music is. So what do you gotta do is take what you know and learn how to make music with that. Now if you know a couple scales already, let's say you know the pentatonic scale, maybe the major scale and the minor scale, right? You could play all the music you want with just those notes, I guarantee you. I'm not trying to say don't learn any more scales, right? Obviously it's good to expand your repertoire, but you, you wanna have a good foundation of how to put these to use. You gotta be able to actually use the scales, not just play them, right? So let's take for example minor pentatonic scale. Okay, if you want to create music with it, you only need a handful of notes. In fact, 
The pentatonic scale is only made up of five notes, penta five, right? So we can even take four of those notes and make music with that. How do I know? Because great guitar players have already blazed the trail and proved that you can create not only music, but you can go down in history as a guitar legend just with four notes. B.B. King, for example, he is like, you know, who can touch him, right? And he could make it happen with four notes. But here's the thing, he doesn't know any secret notes. We know all the same notes that he, that he knew, right? So we can, it's just about how we use them. So let's take, for example, minor pentatonic scale. Let's just use, like I was using earlier, this little, this little box right here between the fifth fret and seventh fret on the D and the G string. I can create tons of music with those four notes, and I'm confident in that because I put in the work to do that. But a lot of guitar players just blow past that. They don't, they don't think that that's where the music is. They think I just have to learn the whole fretboard, the pentatonic across the whole fretboard, then I can play music. I can't tell you how many times I've been hit up by guitar players who are like, I know how to play all five pentatonic, you know, all caged pentatonic shapes in any key all across the fretboard. Why does anything I play not sound good, right? And I'll tell you why. It's because you didn't even bother to try making four notes sound good. You can't make four notes sound good. You're not going to make 400 notes sound good. It's not how it works. So you got to start with just four notes. So starting with this little box, this little hot box here, it's a perfect starting point. If you were to throw in a backing track, right, and just force yourself to come up with interesting ideas. Now you can do bends, vibratos, slides, all the stuff to make your playing expressive, but just don't venture outside of that little box. Just stay there. So if you're gonna sit there and force yourself to go. So just, I didn't even have a backing track there. I was just sitting there playing it, trying to make it sound good and expressive and just feel it, right? And just doing that within that box. If I can do it, you can do it. So that's what I'm, what I'm encouraging you to do is just focus on limiting to just a handful of notes, limiting yourself to those notes. Make those notes work. Make them sing. Do what you gotta do to make it interesting to yourself. And force yourself to. Don't get bored too quickly because you might want to. But you wanna fight that impulse. Right? You want to power through it and just force yourself because if you run out of ideas, let's say in the first couple minutes with just those notes, it's not the notes fault. Okay? And I say that with love, but I'm just telling you that it all comes down to how many ideas do we have, not how many notes do we have. And the final thing that prevents intermediate guitar players from progressing to the next level is not trusting their ear. You have much more musical intuition than you think and it all comes down to this you have a connection with music. If you didn't, you wouldn't be here watching this. All the years that you spent listening to music, loving music, absorbing it, all right, all that stuff, it's still there. And it's even like a guidepost for you, it can be, if we know how to use it. But our ear typically will tell us what sounds good or what doesn't sound good when it comes to the music we listen to. We use that same standard when it comes to what we play. So sometimes we'll play something and our ear will perk up and be like, ooh, that was cool. Sometimes it'll play in our ear and be like, mm, nah, do better, right? <laughs> and that's an important thing. That's something we should listen to. But if you find yourself not hearing, you know, the positive end of things from your ear, generally the reason for that is because you have a lot of bad habits that your ear is just bored of listening to, right? So ways that you can sort of um, kind of shock the system in a way is if you were to, let's say, approach playing, uh, improvising a solo, in one particular way. Let's say you always start a solo like this. You know, that lick that's been played a bazillion times, right? If that's the first way you approach a solo, okay, and you're like, man, I'm bored of the way I approach solos. It's like, duh, you're only doing it the same way. So do it a different way. If let's say you start low and you go high, like, do the opposite. Just, just do the opposite of what you normally would do. Like, so instead of starting low and going high, it's like you're starting high, you know, doing something a little different and then forcing yourself to continue to do the opposite of whatever impulse you feel that you should do. So if you're like, oh, I want to do this, 
another lick that's been played a billion times, right? But instead, how about this? Why don't you do, uh, uh, why don't you start here? That's a little better, right? It's different enough to not sound like what you normally do, but it's not so different that it's just really complex and hard to do, right? You can just take slight similarities in what you normally want to do, but just change things like the order of the notes or the direction you're going, you know, uh, in pitch, right? So little changes like that can actually help you perk your ear up and think, oh, that sounded kind of cool. Another thing that's fun to do is wandering through a scale, which sounds counterintuitive, but when you're first getting used to how a scale works when you're trying to use it to create music, it's important to just know what every note sounds like, right? Don't just blow past it by going, right? Because then you're not really listening to what's happening. And remember, that right there, that whole like G pattern pentatonic thing that I just played, that's more than the five notes in the pentatonic scale. These are the five notes, one, two, three, four, five. And then it just happens again, one, two, three, four, five, and just kind of keeps going to fill out the six strings on the guitar. But there's only, uh, there's only five notes. So if we're just gonna focus on these five notes in the pentatonic scale, the best way to get to know them is to kind of hear them in relation to the root note. So start with the root note, right? So if we're in A minor, the root note would be here, right? And then we have our minor third, our flat third, right? Going back and forth just to kind of, again, hear how it sounds when it clashes with the root note. And then now we do, we're gonna do the fourth here. And then the fifth. And then our flat seven or minor seven. So it's, it's just like each one kind of invokes a different sort of uh, emotion, you could think. Right, like the minor third has some attitude. You know, if we think of the fourth, that seems to have like poise. You know, and then let's try the fifth. That's kind of like a... Kind of sounds like a... You know, one of those, uh, like, uh, you know, announcing an archery tournament. All right, root and fifth. And then with the flat seven. There's some attitude right there. So they all kind of have a different sort of sound. So you can think about that, and it'll actually, your ear, what it's going to do, it's going to pick up on it. And over time, you're going to be able to create melodies in your head, and you're going to know exactly where to play them on the, on the, in the scale, right? Because... You just listen to how every note in the scale relates to the root note, and you're going to get better and better at pinpointing. You're trying to invoke an emotion with the idea you write in your head. You're going to be able to just figure it out and find it on the guitar. So if I were to come up with a phrase, I could just hum it, like, you know, you know, you don't have to be a good singer to do it, case in point, you know. There we go. That's what matters, is that I had the idea, and even though it was like, pitchy and very didn't sound good at all when I hummed it but where it counts right playing it on the guitar that's where it mattered right that's where it came out good so I just created that phrase and I was able to find it in the scale by using that exact same trick and also trusting my ear to come up with something that actually sounds kind of cool in the beginning there's going to be a lot of trial and error but that's okay right you want to go through that uh, stage where you're just like just practicing and just and just trying out different ideas. You'll find some works, some will work, and some won't work. And as you're like sifting through and, and sticking with the ideas that work, that's what you can add to your arsenal. So when you're out there in the wild playing, that's when you can start busting out some cool licks because they've already gone through that litmus test. So with everything that I've just covered, if you're encountering any of those roadblocks and you practice those solutions, I guarantee you that those are never gonna pose a problem for you ever again. And you're gonna have the red carpet laid out for you to move on to that next level. Now, guitar progress killers can come in many shapes and forms, but luckily we have put in the work and we have figured out the 12 most common progress killers. But not only that, but just like in this lesson, we've come up with specific ways to address those progress killers so that they are never a problem for you no matter what level you're at. And that brings me to your free gift. This bad boy right here. This is a free 30 second survey that's gonna tell you your number one progress killer and it's gonna give you a tailor-made lesson on how to conquer that progress killer forever, and it'll never be a problem for you ever again. So be sure to click here to take that survey or check that link in the description box.
Leveling up can be a challenging journey, but I can promise you it's the most rewarding. And once you know exactly what you need to do to conquer those things that are killing your progress, there's gonna be no stopping you.